Uh, I'm the CTO of Solid Optics. Uh, we're based in uh, LA and in Amsterdam. Uh, we're uh, selling compatible optics. And this presentation is about uh, the future of beyond 10 gig with multiplexing. It's a challenge for me as a CTO uh, to find a solution for my customers with this. And from one gig to 10 gig, it was easy. Uh, you just had your optic, you had your passive multiplexer, you just swap your one gig optic, you put your 10 gig DWM optic in it, and you can multiplex 10 gig. But how does that work for 25 gig, 40 gig, 100 gig, and why doesn't it work like that? That is the presentation for today. And your ingredients for multiplexing for dark fiber projects are three things. You got your dark fiber, you got your multiplexer, and you got your transceivers that send out that specific light. And I tried to cover all three of them. First, we'll start with dark fiber. There are two constraints on the dark fiber with light. First of all, you get your attenuation, and the attenuation is the dimming of light. The, the brightness of the light gets less over fiber. That's the first one. The second one is dispersion, which is the blending of light. Not all the light is traveling at the same speed of light, so there is a merge of the signal. So after 80 kilometers, the pulses are a bit overlined and blurred out. That dispersion is the biggest problem for higher speed, as you can see here. At your one gig, you didn't have that problem. So you can do DWM up to 200 kilometers, no problem. Then at 10 gig, dispersion gets a bit of a problem because at 80 kilometers, it's kind of maxed out. Then at 25 gig, that dispersion gets a huge problem because it's maxed out at 15 kilometers. So you cannot run DWM more than 15 kilometers uh, on 25 gig. And this is just on the DWM wavelength because dispersion and attenuation differ a lot with the frequency or the nanometers or the colors, how you want to call it. So if you're looking at a DWM or 1515 window, the orange line is the attenuation, the blue line is the dispersion. You have low attenuation, you got like 0.21 dB loss per kilometer for the DWM, but you get high dispersion. If you look at the 1310 or where we, uh, the LR or the gray optics are emitting, you hardly have dispersion, but you have high attenuation. So you don't have a perfect color to admit in. So you don't have a perfect color to send traffic over. You always have or dispersion or you have high attenuation. The second ingredient for, uh, for the dark fiber projects are multiplexers. Multiplexers, you can just visualize it as a dark side of the moon, the album of Pink Floyd. Uh, where you have multiple colors, you're just going to a prisma and then mux together going on the dark fiber. On the other side of the dark fiber, you get that line coming in and the colors are getting out. The colors are emitted by specific optics that are sending red, green, blue, purple light out. That's how you should visualize how passive mux works. In reality, it works differently. You get two types of passive muxes. One is built with cascaded TFF filters, the other one is AWG. 95% of all the communication worldwide will go over cascaded TFF filters. The little tubes of like an inch big, and um, they got three fibers. They got a fiber going in, with, and they got one fiber going out with one color, and one fiber with the rest of the spectrum, as you can see here. Every little tube has 0.3 dB loss. And 95% of all the muxes and all the OEDMs are working like this, and they are cascaded. So here you see an image of an eight-channel CWM mux, and it will start with a 1470 tube. It will take the color out. The rest of the spectrum will go to the 49 tube, takes that color out, and then the rest will go to the 1510 tube, and so on, and so on. All these cascaded tubes are fusion spliced and put in a little box called an ABS casing. Two of these, so the mux and the demux, are put together in a passive mux in a 19-inch casing, what you all recognize in your data center. This is how a typical mux works. You have another type as well. It's called an AWG, and this is more for the higher count. 
So if you have your 40 channel marks, you got a 96 channel marks, you're gonna need this type. You don't wanna have 40 times 0 0.3 dB loss because you're talking about 12 dB loss for a mux. So this is built on a chip, it's another technique, a more complex technique that is, if you have 40 channel, you have to use this and it's a cheaper solution. The insertion loss of muxes like this are starting at 3 dB. So if you have a typical one, it's a 40 channel mux, it's 3 dB, as you can see here. They have a transmission window. They got different transmission window. If you look at the picture here, the red line is the DWM light. The DWM light always moves a bit. It's got a spec, but because of temperature, it will move a bit to the left, to the right, but that's normal. That is, uh, so it's moving in the green area, which is the reference passband. The attenuation is the yellow block there. And of course, you want to have as low attenuation as possible. But you have two different types of transmission window. One is the Gaussian fit, and the other one is a flat top. The Gaussian fit is a more pointier one where you have low attenuation in a sweet spot in the middle, but your pass band is a bit narrower. And you also have a flat top, which has a attenuation of say four and a half dB for a four channel. The Gaussian fit will have three dB max attenuation. Your flat top has a wider reference pass band and more attenuation. Why is this important? In the future, you will have different types of waves. Your DWM 10 gig is a pretty narrow wave. It will fit perfectly in your Gaussian fit uh, MUX, your AWG MUX. But a coherent 100 gig, 200 gig, 400, 800 gig can have wider waves. The same as a DWM PAM4 is a wider wave. If you would use a Gaussian fit, it will bounce to the isolation and you will have more attenuation there. And the flat top, you, it, you're gonna need a flat top. And all the TFF filters, so the regular muxes are all using TFF or uh, flat top filters, so you won't have that problem. I found out it's this the hard way because we're building a, uh, a DWM PAM4 solution and this is costing me four days to find out, so I wanted to help you avoid this issue. The third ingredient for multiplexing is uh, light or the transceiver itself. We got three windows, ITU grids. Uh, we all know the CWM, we all know the DWM. There is a new band which is getting a bit more popular called the LWDM, LWDM band. The LWDM band doesn't have any dispersion. Remember that is at the 1310 you don't have the dispersion so you can get higher speeds in that region. Well, the LWDM multiplexing, you could do eight channels in that 1310 band. So it's eight times 25 gig up to 40 kilometers because remember you had that higher attenuation there. The advantage is you can just use regular passive muxers, regular optics, hook that up and it works. In the future, you will also have 100 gig, um, up to 15 or maybe even 40 kilometers that will come. And this is used a lot in Korea and China for five gig uh, implementation. Because it's such a cheap technology, they're using just a couple of 25 gigs to the cell tower and this is the cheapest way to do that. So if you wanna do more than 10 gig with the dispersion you have, what you can do is modulation. Typically, if you have a 10 gig signal, it sends out zeros and ones. So you have a 10 gig signal with 10 gig data. But if you will find a way of sending more per bout, then you could do more data per 10 gig bout rate. That's actually what modulation is. With modulation, you have got different techniques. You get a ton of techniques. I won't go through all of them. I just visualized a couple of them. You could amplitude modulation where you just, instead of doing on and off or dim and uh, completely off and completely on, you make different stages in it. So you do half dim, full dim, and so on. So you can make four stages in it. And you also have phase. So your sinus curve is not in the middle, but just a bit to the left and a bit to the right. Those techniques, the amplitude and the phase, they are used nowadays in your 400 gig uh, modulation. 
You can combine these two as well, where you have amplitude and you got phase. And that, if you have four amplitude or four amplitude and four phases, four times four makes 16 different positions where your signal can be. So that is called 16 cam. So in, you have a lower bound rate, but you have more possibilities that there are. So you can multiplex it times 16. These techniques are used in modulation. For example, in this coherent 100 gig optic. To use the modulation, you need a DSP chip, di a digital signal processing chip. This needs a lot of power, a lot of watts. So for example, the CFP2 DCO needs 20 watts. We are all using QSP28, and we want a solution in the QSP28 because your Cisco Juniper Sienna router is using that. But that is maxed out to four and a half watts. So that modulation technique of COM 16 COM doesn't fit in a QSP28. So in a way, you need an extra box to put that CFP2 DCO in. There is a solution with QSP28. It's using PAM4 modulation. It's not a really, really strong modulation, so it does fit in the Qs of P28, but due to that modulation power, there's no optical budget left, so it hardly sends light out. So you need a box to amplify that light. PAM4 also needs dispersion compensation, so you're going to need a box with, amp uh, with uh, an ad file with a tunable dispersion compensator all inside. This is one of the cheapest way of multiplexing multiple hundred gigs from one side to the other. Microsoft is pushing this technology for years already to put like 32 times 100 gig over 70 kilometers to their other data center. So that is uh, pushing this technology. We built uh, a solution for this as one. We call it an all-in-one box or an ad box where you have everything inside. Just a summary of the solutions. Uh, you got the LWDM, you can do 40, uh, you got up to 40 kilometers, eight times 25 gig, uh, also 100 gig in the future. Your LWDM optics will be roughly $400, $500. Your passive MUX will be $500. So that's a really cheap way of multiplexing more than 10 gig. Then you get your Qs of P PAM4 solution. Uh, the optics itself will be around 3.5K. Uh, the box, the white box there in the middle, will be around 6.5, 7K. So you will start with 10K per side to start to multiplex. Uh, more uh, 100 gig and more, up to 80 kilometer. Then you have the third solution will be the CFP2 DCO solution. Uh, you'll start with your QSP SR, which will go into your router switch. That will put to an extra box where you will have your CFP2 DCO in, and that will go to your passive max. Pricing will be around 17K to 20K per site for that. There is a new optic, My, uh, the previous presenter all, also showed this. 400 gig is coming, 400 gig ZR. Uh, it's gonna be in a QSPDD. When I made the presentation a couple of months ago, I thought it would go from one gig to 10 gig, then nothing, and then it would be a 400 gig tunable ZR that you can just plug in your router switch, put in a passive max, and it will transport it in 80 kilometers. As far as I've seen the MSAs right now, you're gonna need AdFast for it. And before there is an optic ready where you can just plug it in your router switch, put it on your passive box, tunable 80 kilometers and put another one in. It will take two, three years. I've checked also with some suppliers from us and the first version, they will need AdFast for this. A couple of additional hints for also because we were, build, we were testing a lot of 100 gig optics and we're building this box and we, we came with a, a couple of problems as well. One of them is RSVAC. We've been having a lot of issues, also support cases with RSVAC. You have, for example, a Mellanox 100 gig card and the RSVAC is always on. If you have on the other side an optic and LR, SR, Optic, sometimes it's off. So not all the vendors implemented the RSVAC the same way. 
If you cannot get a link with 100 gig, you might look to RSVAC. If you look on uh, Solid Optics TV channel, our YouTube channel, there's a nice movie about that. Could save you a couple of days of debugging as well. Another uh, hint I would like to give is clean. For the one gig and 10 gig, you could get away with it. It was like more marketing than actually needed. We didn't find a lot of problems with one gig, 10 gig, and also about 80 kilometers of multiplexing. You kind of could get away with it. 100, 100 gig, you cannot. With 100 gig, you really, really have to clean. You have to learn it yourself. Just use one-click cleaners. Make those lenses clean. If you see CRC errors with 100 gig, it's typically cleaning. You have to get the lens clean, your patch cable clean, and you have to get a habit of doing that and also train your technician to do this. It's no marketing trick anymore. It's the real stuff now. So this is my last slide, and this was my presentation. I was really quick again. But, uh, are there any questions? Yes, not. I will be at the Starbucks. If you're going to need uh, extra questions or you want to look at the box that we designed, uh, have some more question about your optical network, uh, be my guest. Thanks, guys.